Hunters, how is it going? I'm back with episode 48 of Keyboards Be the Rambles. We are nearly at the finale of this season. Uh, so, my guest at this time with his glorious beard. I said this at the start, but you have a glorious beard, as I know. Beard and beard. So, he has a 20 plus year career in professional wrestling, uh, and he is a head coach at the Extreme Academy of Wrestling. He's a beast behind the most controversial part wrestling podcast in the UK. Right hand. That is my right hand, yeah. Uh, and the man. And the man behind the new book, Simply the Beast, uh, it's an autobiography, which is available to download on Kindle and available to buy on Amazon. But as I give you the British Beast, Dominator. And then Hello, we- mate. How you doing? All good, man. All good. And then right here we have the pyrotechnics, because that's the magic of YouTube. And I haven't had pyrotechnics for years, but God bless you for saying them. <laughs> well, well a nice intro as well. You didn't fuck it up too much. No, I, I, I do fuck up my intros, and I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy. I will admit that I'm proud of um, no message because that's what makes it real. It's the reality. Absolutely right. So, um, yeah, like I said before, I press record. We have never met before, but it's an honor to meet you. Um, yeah, thank you. Nice, nice to meet you. And you. Um, so, are we ready for the questions? Yeah, man, you for anything and everything, you send it my way and I'll knock it right back over the net. Right. So, Dominator, as I say, every time somebody comes on, everybody has a story, especially in wrestling, and I love to hear about it. So, for the dozens and dozens watching at home, cheesy, I know, how and why did you get into wrestling? It's, it's the age old story, mate, of, uh, of being a huge fan when, when I was a kid. I was always. I was brought up. My my my, uh, my father was a, 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 a top golf professional. In fact, my entire all the male side of my family were golf professionals. My great grandfather captained the Ryder Cup team. Um, my my uh, grandfather and my father were both training professionals, and I was the first one to throw my golf clubs in the bush and say, "Fuck that! I don't want to do it." Um, but I always loved sport, all ball sports. Absolutely loved rugby, football, you name it. But one day, uh, one Saturday afternoon, it came on the TV, as is the case with most people of, of my age, dare I say. And, uh, and uh, the, the love of it, it, it was immediate. Um, and so it was, I must have been, I was probably about five years old, very young. Um, and as soon as I was, uh, I was able, when I was 17, I'd saved up enough money to uh, actually go abroad and do it. I didn't know there's any such thing as wrestling schools in this country. It was only when I came back and uh, got all the bitter old bastards like fucking, uh, you know, you had all the Robbie Brookside's and your and your uh, 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 what's his name uh, McGregor. Uh, I can't remember his face first. His Christian name now. And uh, Finley's all like, oh, well, we could have trained you. We could have trained you. How, do, how would I have known about it? You know, you, there was no <laughs> magazines. There was no. There was no internet. There was no nothing. You know, there was uh, there was a- absolutely bugger all. There weren't even newsletters back then, so you couldn't. You know, you had no way of finding it out. So there we go. Nice, like it. That's uh, completely different. You know, usually it's a case of I watch it on TV, thought I'm going to go to a wrestling school, done, job done. But no, I like that. So you went abroad. Uh, what was the training school? Who was the training school, and who trained you? Well, it was a uh, Skull Crushers uh, training school uh, uh, run by Exotic Adrian Street. Um, I was, I'd always been a fan of Adrian's and <clears throat> I had the opportunity of going to the Mon- uh, Larry Sharp's Monster Factory or going to Skull Crushers. And my parents at the time had uh, an apartment out in Long Key in Florida. So uh, one year when I was up there, I went up to see him. He was on the north. Uh, he, he was on the northwest panhandle, Pensacola. And we were further south down near Tampa and um, went to visit him and Linda and obviously, being a fellow, a fellow, uh, a fellow Brit, um, he was, in, in, you know, he was just fantastic. Great company, him and Linda. They'd also had um, at the time Paul, Paul, uh, Paul Terrell, sorry, um, who'd been over there, and a young, another young Welsh lad who I think quit the business not long after. But the majority of the guys in the states uh, who would go to Adrian were guys who had been on the scene and been working the territories and just wanted to go there to brush up. 
because obviously there wasn't this, uh, um, you know, like now we've got an influx of the, Brit the, the British wrestling style is very, um, I wouldn't say overused, but it's, it certainly has been fashionable. Um, and so all the old Billy Robbins and stuff and all, all of old Adrian's old stuff, it was, uh, it, it wasn't a big, you know, it wasn't a big deal to, to a lot of the guys in the, in the UK, we already had it, but to the, to the Americans who were just doing the basic, the, you know, basic calling internationals and the, all that stuff, it was a big deal to go to Adrian's to brush up. And that's, um, so I've got, I, I just got to go out there as a, and I was, I was, I was tiny, I was, like, I was a skinny little fucker, got to go out there and having had everybody, uh, friends, family telling me, you're never going to do it, you're, you're never going to make it, you're too fucking small. And there's nothing more that, that would have driven me forward than having people tell me, you ain't going to be able to do it. Um, always happens, always happens. Oh, you're never mm. going to be a wrestler. The other, the, common, the other common one is wrestling isn't a real job, and that pisses me off. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, to a lot of people, to a lot of people, it, it, it isn't, and they never go into it with with that in mind. But um, and I'll be honest with you, when I when I went into it, I, I've I've had people over the years who said, "Well, you never got into WWE, you know, you, you never got into it was never you never you know you know." And it's like, well, you try and turn around to Danny Boy Collins or to Skull Murphy and so, or, or even to Adrian Street, who none of those guys worked in the Fed. Yeah. Uh, tell them that they, they weren't pro wrestlers. Do you know what I mean? It depends what path you want to take. You can go on to inspire the people. You can go on to be groundbreaking in your own way. You don't have to go down that particular route. And I'll be perfectly honest, when I was a kid, I looked I look like nothing. I looked like any kid down the pub. Do you know what I mean? There was nothing that stood out particularly. Um, and I never had any intention of... I, I, if someone had said to me, you'll have a 27-year career and, and have... Uh, travel to the countries I've been to, I'd never have believed them. Fair enough, yeah. Uh, so, different countries you've been to, let's hear about where you've been, and uh, yeah, whose ass have you kicked uh, abroad? Everyone's. I, I've, <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, God, I've been to I've been to Germany, been to Italy, been to Spain, been to France, Belgium, Holland, um, obviously wrestled in the, in the States. Um the first country I wrestled in, uh, which was my debut, was in Jamaica. Nice. Um, which was, it wasn't nice, it was fucking horrendous. Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anyone who's read my book will have read all about it. It was it was nuts. They'd never seen live wrestling before. Oh, so it was a case, and we went out there for this promoter from the Cayman Islands who had come to Adrian's school, and he wanted a bunch of wrestlers. So he wanted a team of eight, and I was the only British guy there. The rest... We're all, we're all we're all yanks and um we went out he was from the cayman islands and bloody had a lot of money and he flew us out there and we were supposed to be out there on a year's contract we ended up being there for five days and uh, we <laughs> we had to we had to build the ring from scratch oh man <laughs> we went to this place called the dragon gym in montego bay and uh, it was right next to this massive football stadium and uh, we went there and, and we we were like keith his name was keith wong he was uh, half chinese or like, Where's the fucking ring? And I'm not going to bother doing the accent because so we ain't going to go down that road. But he said, that, well, I haven't got one. He said, there's a boxing gym here. He said, we've got some posts, so I've got some ropes, and that's it. So with the guys, we had to go to a hardware store, getting bitten by mosquitoes and make a fucking ring from scratch. And we did it. And on the night of the show, when the guy was coming in playing the music, we, there wasn't a soul there, not one person. But the Jamaican national football team were next door playing in the stadium. They heard all the music and saw these white guys bashing each other about and wanted a piece of it. And we ended up, there, was, there must have been over 2,000 people there. But they, they, they you know, my, I was the first guy out that night, and I was against a guy called Irish Brett Dillon, and I was, I was baby-faced. He beat me with a, he had a, a foreign object, which I think was a padlock and knocked me out of it. And he had to lock himself in the locker room. These guys wanted to stab him. They, they went, <laughs> they, you know, they, they, were, they weren't smartened up to the job at all. But that was a, a most mental trip of all. An experience, uh, if anything, um, it was unbelievable, mate. It was honestly, I, and I wish to God, I've around my house, I've got loads of old. Um, we stayed in this place called the Upper Deck, which anyone who's been to Jamaica will know that is. It's, it's, it's like the most beautiful uh, place there, and it's right on top of a hill. And at the bottom of the hill, there's this market town, and 
of course, being white tourists, you're getting pulled in into all these little huts, left, right, and centre. And and I was a, I was 18 years old, terrified. So I was buying everything. I was like, yeah, yeah I was giving my money away, left, right, and centre. I was buying everything. So I've, I've got uh, I've got <laughs> I've got shelves full of all these wooden trinkets and stuff that I bought back from Jamaica. And none of the other guys got anything, so I'm kind of pleased that I brought some of it back. But it, it was a, a, the ultimate wrestling fuck job. We had armed guards when we left because the promoter didn't want us to leave. It was, um, I saw someone shot in a drive-by our first night there. It was just mental. Wow. So that, that's a unique story in itself, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Wow. So uh, your early years in uh, in, your, in your wrestling career, um, any highlights, any memories, any bad times? Loads of bad times, loads of good times. I, I, I did, a, to begin with, I did a lot of traveling around. A, a, a guy came back with me as my tag partner, a guy called Magnificent Mike Montero. He was this um, Hispanic guy. He was all jacked up. Um, a guy from Washington, D.C. And we went around and Brian Dixon had us as the American Chippendales, um, which was just fucking the worst. Um, and I was going around with the, the perfume spray canister like Rick oh, Martel, yeah. you know. And that went oh, that went down well at the Corn Exchange in Norwich. Do you know what I mean? We, we nearly got fucking killed. Um, and we, 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 we went all over the place and we wrestled some good, great talent like the Superflies and the Liverpool lads and some of the great tag teams at the time. And then he, he was eating me out of house and home. Uh, he was a great big dude. And I said, look, you know, I said, I'm the one doing all the work here. I can't afford to keep your, your fat ass in, in this country. So you're going to have to go home. And then when he went home, I... Um, I started doing the rounds myself and I got to work for uh, Neil Evans, who was a lovely little fella. He used to work as Tom Thumb. I got to work for Orig um, in yeah. real a few times um, with Drew McDonald, which was a real honour because Drew was one of the first big stars that I worked with, who uh, obviously I was a big fan of on TV. So um, difficult. I mean, probably the hardest of all was working for Max Crabtree because that was on the, Brit the, Brit the, Brit the British Bulldog Tour when he came back. Uh, he'd been, him and him and Warrior, I think, got, got kicked out of the uh, WWF for uh, using numerous substances. Yeah. And so they, they snapped him up because Big Daddy had several strokes and wasn't um, able to work anymore. So they, they, they got older David Boy. So they did a bunch of tours and I was on those. Uh, we did Grimsby, we did uh, Scunthorpe. I can't remember where else we did it. We did it, but... They were just full of, and don't get me wrong, they were great workers on there. But the guys in the job back then, they were very bitter, the fact that I'd come from Adrian's school, that I'd gone to America to learn how to how to wrestle. And I'd come in all this wonderful, brightly coloured, flamboyant, you know, we had other tassels. It was like, do you know what I mean? And I'd come back and I was this young kid um with all this real fancy clothes on and and they hated me immediately because oh, oh you're one of adrian's boys right so immediately i got targeted and had their shit kicked out of me and looking back on it i probably deserved it if i'm honest do you know what i mean i walked in there thinking i was the shit um yeah. and so you've got all these old timers in there like barry douglas skull murphy dave taylor all of that and they're, they're like oh so uh, you're one of adrian's boys are you you might as well have just put a fucking bullseye there um, and said, have at it, you know. And so, yeah, I've got a few kickings. And, uh, but you know what? The job, as we will probably no doubt talk about later on, has changed so much. And I regret nothing. No, that's good. That's, that's uh, really good that you don't regret anything, regardless of what's happened. So, why do you think you were hated? And is it because you went international to go and get trained by, <clears throat> by Adrian? It, do you think that was just because, you know... So Adrian you... was really controversial. He was the first guy in this country to come out to music. He was the first guy to wear face paint. Um, he, in fact, as when he went over to the States, because he was getting blacklisted left, right and centre here, people... He used to... It's a little story a lot of people don't know. In the changing rooms, he used to draw a pair of eyes on the wall and he'd practice finger poking them like that. Because the amount of people that would charge him, although we're talking fans, he'd have to just poke people's eyes. People right. were attacking Linda um, because they thought he was, you know, they're like, oh, you fucking queer, we're going to end up with They wanted to kill him. And Adrian is the, I don't know if you've ever met Adrian, he's the least, um, the least camp man you'd ever want to meet in your life. He's a, he's a hard, 
a very hard man. Yeah. And I don't say that lightly. He's a real hard man. The guy's just beaten throat cancer at the age of 80. Do you know what I mean? He's a real, he's the real deal. He always has been. And he'd be the first to tell you as well. <laughs> but he's, um, uh, what are we talking about? Sorry, I've got distracted here. Sorry, um, this is why it's called Rambles, because we just go on and on and on. Yeah, I, I just, my question was, why do you think... That- oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was basically because he, he was the first guy, really, uh, the first Brit um, to make it big in the States. Um, he, he, he left, he'd had enough of it over here. He was getting so much heat. Um, he, so he left and he became uh, friends with Dusty Rhodes. And um, it, he obviously was, he was big in Mid-South. He was yeah. big in Florida Championship Wrestling. Ended up in the NWA. He ended up, he was the one just uh, through drawing a pencil drawing, designed the Road Warrior shoulder pads. Not a lot of people know that, and that's a, a, a and he 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 was huge. He was getting massive heat. You look at some of his matches out there with, you know, against Austin Idol and Jerry Lawler in Memphis, even, and they were huge, absolutely. Yeah. He, and he was making big, like huge money. Nothing like there was nothing like that in the UK. And so of course he was hated. And then when he started producing, so you know, two or three of the boys started coming back over, like me with all these fancy clothes, all the people like Johnny Angel and um, not Drew McDonald. Drew was lovely, but a lot of the, Ian McGregor was the other guy I was trying to think of. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, sort of bitter guys were like taking one look at you and like, who, who the fuck do you think you are? Oh, you're one of Adrian's boys. And, and like I say, it's not like now where anyone can rock up and have a tryout and get, get a job. Adrian was, the, was way ahead of his time. And because of that, was detested by a lot of people. Oh, that's a shame, really. You know, if you used to look at it nowadays in wrestling, that'd be considered a good thing. Well, he's loved moment. now. Of course, he's he's hugely respected, admired, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me. And I hope they do put put him in the Hall of Fame one day soon, um, uh, because that would just be fantastic. But he, he he's admired and loved around the world, and people emulate his style. But back then, the workers over here, like I said to you before, and again. Sorry for keep plugging it in my book. Oh the, no, all good. Back, back, back then they did not want us in. They didn't want the youngsters in the job. There was no, nobody wanted to welcome you back in, and they could all turn around and say, "Oh, Stu's lying. That's all bullshit. It's not bullshit. It's true." Um, we were, you know, Justin Richards or, or, or would say the same. Um, they tried to to break his his fucking arm when he first got in the job because they didn't <sighs> want to see him come back again. Um, you know, you can't, you can't do, you, you can't, you would never get away with slapping someone nowadays. But back, oh, then, yeah. back then, they were happy to say, right, stick him on with uh, Skull and Skull will give him a hiding or whatever and go twist him up or stretch him. And we, you, we thought nothing of it. Um, so, pretty much, the younger generation have it easy, in a sense. Well, I, I, I'd get sort of slaughtered for saying that, but I, I believe so very much. Um, just, not just for that reason, but for, for the for so many things. We when I left Skull Crushers, do you remember those old? You might not be old enough to remember those computer printouts on green paper. No, I don't think so. No, I didn't think so. You should have you you could print out the sheets and reams and reams of paper, and then it was like green lined paper. That was as close as you could get to the printed word if you wanted to write something. Um, on, on your ZX Spectrum or whatever it was we had back in those days. And Adrian, at the end of my thing, I got a certificate to say I was, I'd, I'd now achieved uh, pro level and this great big ream of paper, which was about 50 yards long with all these promoters' names and numbers and addresses from uh, all around the world. And he was like, there you go. He said, you're your own fucking agent, go. And it was like, what do I do with this? <coughs> you know, there was no such thing as, Someone making your own music for you, making your own promo video for you. There was no agents. There was nothing. It was just me and this little uh, this little te- telephone box. Keep throwing my dimes in it, trying to call back to the UK. So someone give me some fucking work, you know. There was nothing. There was nothing. And so you, we we had to work. You had to work our bollocks off to get work. And then when you did get work, of course you were met with massive hostility, uh, which you just had to part with. Oh, yeah. So, um, obviously, the wrestling uh, world has evolved since when you started to now. How much do you think it has evolved? Because it sounds like it's evolved a hell of a lot. But what, in your own, you know, in your own words, how 
evolved do you think it's gone? For the, for the good, for the bad, for the ugly, whatever. In, in the sense of in-ring or out of the ring? Uh, we'll go with out of the ring first because that's what I'm more interested in. Out of the ring, phenomenal. Uh, it's a wonder. It's remarkable. It, it astonishes me. The th- I, I get whenever we, EWW have got a show coming up, we we get sent these <coughs> these promo videos by workers who want to come and work for us that are mind blowing. I'm like, well, holy shit, man! The graphics, the the quality of the content now is unbelievable. You've got things like this show, podcasts. You've got people who are able to communicate with anyone and they're able to put out some, you know, real cinematic level stuff. And it never ceases to amaze me. All we had was, an, <laughs> again, without sounding like an old fuck, it's an eight by ten. And and if you were lucky, a VHS of some grainy old matches. So yeah, yeah. from that from that standpoint, it's wonderful. It's, uh, you know, to be a worker nowadays is great. But in saying that, the competition is so fierce because there's in my opinion too many people working for peanuts and undercutting other guys and i think that should be massively stamped out unless you're a student um and learning your trade i don't think i I mean i've heard stories of guys who've been on the scene 10 years plus working for sort of you know 20 quid uh just to get just to get a book in and that's not work that's a vanity project as far as I'm concerned, and, and that's not that's not right. And there's 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 so many workers now up and down the country. There's 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 some territories, but in each county there's several promotions. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It, it is hard to get work. So be you know if you're good at something, never do it for free. And uh, just think about what you're doing before you take bookings, because it can, it could be an amazing place to be. And I think I've got loads of friends in the states. Um, in the business and they think they're pulling big houses in and they're drawing like 200 300 people which is nothing i'm drawing over a thousand with just my trainees on the show some nights just our just local talent yeah and we're not even bringing in any imports we haven't brought in an import since 2001 um, and well, it's just the way i work it yeah i, yeah. I, I, I would rather give boys uh, work to the boys in this boys and girls in this country and certainly ones that have been, you know, working their ass off um, and learning under myself and my wife. I'd rather I'd rather give those guys. They, they don't automatically get, get work because if they're not good enough, they ain't fucking good enough. Yeah. But it, it upsets me to, to the people in this country don't don't realise how good we've got it. And I, I think I think the um, lockdown is going to fuck things up. I think it's going to take us a good two or three years to build back to what we had. Yeah. Um, but I've got, I've got m- my mate Francisco Chiazzo in America. He's wrestled for everybody. And he's going, oh, look at these crowds we packed in tonight. There's like 200 people in there. And they've got all these ex, old ex TNA got workers on the show, wall-to-wall names, and they're drawing nothing. Whereas over here, we're drawing huge numbers. Well, we were. Um, yeah. <laughs> with, just, with just local talent. And I think if we, if we box clever... We can do it again, but I think people need to realise it is going to take time. Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people uh, were had a lot of momentum behind them, including yeah. as well before the lockdown happened. And it just seemed a really bad time for a lot of people, especially like some of the younger generation wrestling that I know. You know, they had a lot of momentum behind them, loads of potential, and then bang, COVID hit, and now mm. they're just like, well, when can we start again? And that's it, the problem. It's horrible. I feel sad for us. You know, we, we have about 25 students at the Extreme Academy, all different shapes and sizes, ages. Um, and it's been really, really hard keeping them, um, keeping them positive. In fact, we're having a uh, we're having a live watch along tonight of one of our old shows with all of them on one of these one of these meetings. Like uh, and we, we um, my wife, who's a personal trainer, she uh, sets goals for them and tries to, you know, tries to keep them, encourage them from, it's so easy to sit back and, I don't know, whatever you do, smoke a spliff or have a beer no. or, no, do you know what I mean? It's so easy for people yeah. to do that though and fall into them. I and I've just come now from training in my courtyard and it's soul destroying. I, I started off great and then halfway through, I'm like, I want to I kill myself. Do you know what I mean? I want to open a vein in a warm bath. I feel like shit. 
but you've got to do it and I'm retired. So if I can do it, you can do it. And, and tr but trying to keep a group of youngsters motivated is especially like you said, on the back of that momentum we had is so difficult. And I feel very sorry for the people who were, uh, have lost a lot of, uh, uh, lost a lot of momentum about it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a pain in the ass, and I, I like the fact. I love the fact you and your wife are um, trying to keep your trainees uh, motivated and trying to keep them positive. That's, I think, that's something that should happen um, more. You know, especially in wrestling as well. We you? have to. We owe. We owe them that because I mean, there are we. We look at them as our as our kids. You know, yeah. we have to. We look after them. They're they they they're, 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 they're and also not only that that we we are without sounding like a, a cheap cliche. We are a family. And they're a lovely bunch, honestly. Without without my school, <coughs> I wouldn't be anywhere near the wrestling business anymore. I'd have I'd have tracked it in a long time ago. But they they sort of keep me young, and we have it's just not all fun and games. Of course, it isn't. You know, they get the hair dryer treatment like anybody else. But you've got it's it's very important, and I think we are, we we owe um, we owe the youngsters, and that's all trainers, all teachers, anyone listening to this. We owe our students that you know that ability to be able to um i don't know throw off the shackles of this lockdown because it, it's been it's been horrendous for everyone so you said you and your uh, wife run uh, the training facilities and mm. your own promotion so how because personally I, I feel that there's sometimes this whole thing where where a wrestler and you know, with a wife, it's seen as a bad thing. When it it isn't, it really isn't at all. I mean, I'd love for anything if my wife joined me but in wrestling. I'd love mm. it. But how how has it affected you um, working with your wife in wrestling? Is there you know? I can imagine there'd be some bad times, but I, you know, <laughs> it, well, she she was already in the business when we got together. She'd already been uh, wrestling down south for a company called Bauer B A W A in Banbury. Oh yeah, I know that. Uh, yeah, I remember yeah that. she. Yeah, she, she was wrestling for them. And uh, I, uh, you know, we hadn't even met. And it was only when I was wrestling on the old wrestling channel for LDN. And uh, I, I've, I got in touch with her through the old, I think it was the old MySpace, saying, oh, do you fancy? Uh, yeah, you're right, old. So then I, I said, don't you fancy coming up to work as a valet? And uh, she, she was like, yeah, of course. So we ended up hitting it off and the rest was history. But she'd already been in the business. Um, and but she, um, sh she hadn't really learned the basics at all. She was just as she was a spot monkey, you know. She was diving off of high things, <coughs> and, and she was a, she was like she was like fucking Sabu. She couldn't do a wrist, she couldn't do a wrist lock, but she was flying through the air and smashing her hip bones and breaking her. And it was, it was watching her was oh god, it used to make my asshole shrivel. But it was just <laughs> like, it was it was terrifying. So I was like, you need to come to wrestling school. You've got, you saw oh, that's how I started it. And don't get me wrong, it has been hard, you know, because I, I, we, we had several rows. I put, she, she was on our first tour we did, and I put her on with Marty Skull every night, and Marty moaned like a little bitch about it. Oh, I don't want to wrestle, I don't want to wrestle. And then when I, when I fronted him on it, he was like, oh, no, no, I didn't say that. And I said, well... Baby Fisher. I, I said, you fucking did. I said, and because of that, you're on with her tomorrow night as well, you can. So, uh, basically, uh, you know, she wasn't the best, um, but people... Um, who could have gone out of their way to try and sort of teach her. They just wanted to try and stooge her off. So I said to her, look, you, the only way you're ever going to learn is, is the day you come to me and say, I want to learn. I said, I could be bending your ear all day long, saying, I need to get you better. I need to get you in the ring shape. But until you come to me, forget it. And I'm never booking you again. So the rest is history. That's, uh, that's my story. <laughs> but no, I, I think it's great. I, I, I look up to it, you know, the fact you and your wife work together in wrestling. Because like I said, I can imagine. I mean, it's hard enough when you, you when you're going, out, going at it yourself in wrestling, but mm. your wife as well, you know, you, you bring wrestling life into it, personal life as well. But no, fair play to you both, you know. You've got my respect for that. Thank but, you. Like I said, I'd love to do that with my wife. It'd be, it'd be phenomenal, you know. Well, it's, it's, it's not for everyone, do you know what I mean? Obviously, yeah. Ricky and Julia... At WAW, have made uh, have made their living and career off it. You've got yeah. the, uh, the Louvers up at Fight Factory in Lincoln, who are both really good friends of ours. They 
you know, it, it can work, but it, I'm sure it's not for everybody. I mean, um, if, if I think if Tom wasn't wrestling, like I said about my students, I probably wouldn't be doing it. I'd probably be writing books or making movies right now. Um, but she, her enthusiasm and their enthusiasm in turn keeps me going and keeps the old, uh, keeps the old, uh, the old mind going. Said movies. So if you had the opportunity to make a movie, what would it be about? And who would be uh, cast? Well, well, I don't know. I'd cast, but that there, uh, there is an iron in the fire on that front at the moment. Oh. Um, and I'm a big fan of found footage stuff and hillbilly horror. Um, and so we did make a movie, a mini movie, which we had shown on a giant Titan Tron back um, at a show called Survival of the Sickest. And if you look it up, um, it's an old Wild West. Uh, thing that we filmed at a place called Laradoo, which is a proper Wild West town. And we filmed it between the two gangs who were in the show together. And um, it's called Survival of the Sickest. Um, it's uh, You'll find it on YouTube. So that'll give you a little gist of the sort of things that I I have done and want to move into eventually when wrestling is not hold, doesn't hold any interest for me anymore. No, oh, good luck with it in the future. <coughs> so uh, I want to know what your thoughts are on the British indie scene. Uh, so I can imagine this, yeah. All right, just yeah, just answer the question because I'm just gonna. Uh, one. Well, uh, it's it's a hard one. That I mean, we it, it's it's let itself down very badly in a lot of ways because you know I couldn't really come on a show like this and not talk about the the Me Too movement, um, which has dominated a lot of the proceedings over the last you know, like well, the last year, really. Um, I think it's it's been a terrible shame. I was I was listening to Jim Cornette the other day and he mentioned it and said, oh, and it, and it started as, and it started in England. And I was like, wow, do you know? We're, we're, we hold a wonderful... That, they, that, that, that's what the Americans think of us, do you know what I mean? It started in the UK. Holy shit. You know, these... these that, I, I do really have a problem with, with, with that because there's been abuse of all kinds all across the board and we've managed to put several people on the register. We've managed to get a lot of people blackballed from the job and some people don't like that. Um, I have had numerous hate messages and threats from people who would never say shit to my face. Um, but of course you can be who you want and as hard as you want online, anyone can. And uh, we worked really hard um, with the local authorities here in Hastings um, and we had a hot desk set up for any victims who wanted to come forward um, and so my opinion of the British wrestling scene is a little darker than most people you probably speak to I feel a little bit let down by a, uh, by a, a lot of it but that's not saying you know we're talking about a small percentage um, it, and you can't tar everyone with the same brush. I just wish that, that, you know, I just wish people would work, work, work harder on their, on their appearance. Um, and, and that even goes so far as my own students, I would say to them, have you got, have you got your own, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not your own, uh, you know, you're your own agent, no one's going to sell your shit as good as you do, you know? And, and when I first started, that's the first thing Adrian taught mm. me. Get your merch. Get your merch looking good. No, no matter what it is, work on your appearance. I don't care how you look, but don't go out there looking like a scruff bag. People are paying money to see you. It doesn't matter if you're tall, if you're short, if you're fat, if you're thin, if you're, if you're jacked up. Make the most of yourself. Look the part. The amount of scruff bags I see now who've got a ring in their back garden and they might be able to do a trillion assoy moonsaults, but they look like shit. And that really, that depresses me because this isn't UFC. We shouldn't all go out there looking the same. The, the job is still primarily entertainment. So entertain, because going out there in your, in your, in your denim, denim shorts or your Daisy Dukes or your cut off t-shirts, that's fucking, that's so nineties. I just wish people would invest more in themselves. Don't get me wrong. The wrestlers now, uh, 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 some of them are incredible athletes and I take my hat off to them. So the stuff they're doing was stuff, uh, even, at my, uh, even at my fittest and lightest, I couldn't have done. 
So I take my hat off to them. I don't want people to say, oh, he's just bitch, he's old dinosaur. Blah, 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 blah. I don't, I'll take my hat off to you. But please remember that you've got to look the part. That is so fucking important. And anyone who says it isn't is fucking wrong. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Like that. <laughs> So uh, well, you, that's why you see people like people clamoring. You've got WrestleMania around the corner. People are people are losing their minds that the Undertaker's not on the show. The the, the dude's in his sixties. Yeah. If the business was so good now, with the quality of the workers they've got, why should anyone even bear the bear the Undertaker in mind at all? Yeah. Brock Lesnar. No one should give a fuck about Brock Lesnar. No one should give a fuck about the Big Show or Braun Strowman. No one should care about those guys but they still do. Those guys are still making the top money. And so that speaks for itself. You've got some phenomenal athletes in there, but every year people have a little sulk and a win job. Oh, Undertaker's not on. It's not going to be a very good show. It's, you know, I'll, I'll stay in my case there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fair enough. Yeah, I agree. So your podcast, we are going to mention on here, stiff right hand. And like, Thank I, said, you. like I said, in the introduction, it's, uh, them. It's the most controversial podcast in the UK. So, hmm. what makes your podcast be? Uh, what makes your podcast the most controversial one in the UK? Well, the, the, the topics we cover. Um, originally, I didn't have a clue. Uh, the guy who helped me set it up um, is a guy called uh, Jim Hustle, who is behind these. Uh, he's a countryman of yours, actually. Right. And uh, he, he used to run the rock show, which used to get millions of listeners around the world. And he's been an old, old friend of mine now uh, from, uh, he's from Cardiff. And he came to me and said, why don't you do one? And I said, well, what about? And it started off, we, we, we started talking about wrestling. And then we started getting on local, local people who uh, were, you know, had unusual pastimes or very strong opinions politically or about training or so I was, I was kind of using it to highlight um, local talent. And then, of course, the thing happened where my wife and I were getting victims of abuse coming forward um, <clears throat> and coming to us. And uh, we were like, holy shit, what's going on? And all of a sudden, overnight, it went mental. Yeah. And the, the, the listenership shot up from like 5,000 to 30,000. We were getting 30,000 down, 30, downloads a week. Um, and it was mental. It just went absolutely nuts. And now we just have it. We keep it organic. I, I make I make very few notes, and we are we you know we have our, our regular contributors on, and we talk about news stories from around the world, what's happening in wrestling, and uh, just it's balls to the wall. We, there's there is there's no holds barred, and uh, people keep tuning in because they want to. hit they, they know I have strong opinions on, on the scene and certain people on the scene. And I think they want to they wanna listen to me dish the, 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 <laughs> dish the shit on out on people, if I'm totally honest. Yeah. Oh, that's and nice. I'm more than happy to fucking do it as well. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, so what would you say is one of your favourite stories you've ever done on your podcast? Well, the, 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 if, if you listen back... Uh, I mean, Christ, we've, there, there's, there's about 130 episodes of that on our... Uh, if you go to stiffrighthand.com, that's like our landing site yeah. where you can download everything. It's very easy to, it's, uh, very easy to do. Um, and, but probably the Operation Stew Tree, which we did, and I know it had a, you know, it's a funny title, but it was a very serious topic. And that right there was the one that was the launch pad for all of it. Um, <coughs> we talk about all the stuff with Dan Edler, and bubblegum and all of those guys. And uh, at that time, I was getting people, I was getting people like El Laguero messaging me up saying, uh, oh, this mask guy you're talking about, it's not me, is it? I'm like, who else with a fucking mask do you think I'm talking about? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I was getting all these people, uh, without mentioning them, coming to me saying, well, it's not me. Well... If the shoe fits. Yeah, it was funny. No, why, you, why, why worry about contacting a little old me out here in East Sussex? Do you know what I mean? Why, why are you messaging me? And all of a sudden, all these people, um, all you, you know, people like Phil Powers and that were contacting me and going, oh, you know, it's not me. I didn't do nothing. You see, I didn't do nothing. And so I, I took great delight in, uh, uh, you know, these are all worms under a stone and they all hang out together. They're all booked together. And 
there, there's a nasty, a nasty little undercurrent in British wrestling of of older wrestlers who have, have, are regarded as legends who protect them. Right. And yeah. I have a real problem with that mm. because there's been a lot of paedophilia um, yeah. in, in British wrestling over the years, and we're not. We're not talking, you know, for, back from the Mad Eli days. I don't know. If uh, you Mad know. Eli. Yeah, you know, but, but people used to laugh at it. It was like funny. Oh, <laughs> that silly old son who wears all the badges. It was a paedophile. Oh, Do you know no, what I mean? I, did, yes, I didn't he, know that. I didn't he, know that. He did a lot of work for charity, like like Jimmy Savile. But yeah. he was, everyone kind of laughed it off because he was a character. Yeah. Well, no, it was, you know, it was, there was far more to it than that. You know, and, and so a lot of the older crew, um, will not come on my show because they know what I'm going to talk to them about. I've had a lot of guys from uh, the NWA in the States, and I ain't going to name names, but have, who've refused re recently to come on my show. Uh, will Ospreay has also refused to come on my show um, because well, he, says, he says I, uh, I twist things, um, and he, he's very upset um, about that, but he wouldn't explain why. Um, mm -hmm. I know fucking why. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who fucking don't like me, but I, I never got into this job to be liked anyway. And I, and I certainly never started my podcast to be liked. I, I, you know, I don't care about making money uh, on, on my podcast. I care about sharing the truth yeah. and for getting justice for people who, that, who've seen nothing but injustice. And it, it, it's not on. And I, I want to spend my time. Uh, and, and so I will tell them the day I die, Causing these guys a lot of fucking heartache. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because I, I I come across a couple of posts that you've done. Um, Kenny Kilbane was one of them, and so yeah, fucking Kenny Kilbane, man. He he, that motherfucker lied to my lied to me. Um, he, he, <laughs> what now? I'm trying to think of the story with him. He contacted me about something, and uh, I I told him that I had a bit of a problem, a bit of a problem with him, and I can't remember what it was about. And I said to him, I said, well, I said, you don't need to worry too much about me coming to find you and, and uh, giving you a fucking slap, mate, because uh, I said, it's not like you're a paedophile, is it? And he went, oh, no, 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 mate, no, it isn't. Sure, within 10 minutes of that phone call, I was getting messages off some people telling me with screenshots and showing me what he's been up to. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I sent him a message with the screenshot and said, oh, dear me. And all of a sudden, he wouldn't answer my calls after that and was blocking me left, right and centre. And uh, what a fucking worm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing them screenshots myself. Yeah, man. There, there was, and there was loads. And there was loads. And we're talking, uh, you know, we're, we're t <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. I was uh, There was a dude on my Facebook the other night and he was standing up for this guy and said, well, this bloke was only 21 and the, the girl was only just under 18. And what, well, it doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter if she's 17, 16, 15. She might as well be fucking 12. If you're underage or underage. And he knew that, but he carried on. And this is my point, is that people like him, um, they, they were all the equivalent of the milk monitors at school. Yeah. Who you we used to laugh at or flush your heads down the toilet and say, look at that fucking twat. But all these guys have managed to wheedle their way into British wrestling. And because they hold dominion over young boys and young girls, who are desperate for work, yeah. they think they will do anything. Yeah. These these guys managed to get away with it for so many years, and people need to wake up to that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was literally just about to say, I think that's been the issue as well, where, you know, people come in, especially, like, uh, setting up their own training schools as well. Yeah, that's uh, that's another thing. It's, a, it's, the same with, uh, it's the same with Phil Powers, man. I mean, he was... He was beating the shit out of his trainees, and he uh, he said to me, uh, he, <laughs> he told me how he was going to get the police on me. You're frightening my children. They're reading this on Facebook. Why are your kids on Facebook? Why are you showing your kids? Do you know what I mean? He yeah. he he, uh, he was a female abuser. He, he abused uh, um, uh, one of my very very close friends, um, and I'm not going to mention her name on it. No, that's fine. Um, but she's a very, very close friend of mine and, and ours and who's worked for us for many years. And and when I put the stuff out about Phil, he, there must have been about 40 or 50 messages from his current and former trainees saying, uh, about time, yeah, because you are a cunt. None of my students would say that about me because it, it would never happen. But whereas he has been lying, 
stealing and worming his way through the business for fucking years and nobody's ever pulled him up on it for, the, for God knows what reason. Because, oh, it's always been this way. That's what I was told when I first started off. I had a few people who were big up in the business saying, don't waste your time, Stu. You know, it's always been like that. Well, it's always been like that. Well, that means we need to fucking do something about it then. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And just because people think, well, I mean, it needs to be justice by the police. The police don't give a fuck half of the time. So therefore, it is down to the likes of us as promoters and trainers to band together and make sure these pieces of shit never work again. Because the police, I mean, they're only interested at the moment in, in uh, you know, in stopping people from working out and training. Do you know what I mean? They don't give a toss about about paedophiles or kids. There was a, there was a, a local girl who went missing it. That she was missing for five days before the police did anything about it. And I'm not demonising all of the all of the old bill, but when it comes to things like this, they're very slow in in in, uh, in doing anything about it. So therefore, um, it's down to the likes of us as podcast hosts, as promoters, as trainers to band together and knock these fuckers out of the business. And if they want to go to Japan and ply their trade over there, we'll let them go over there. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, it's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Um. You know, it's a shame it's taken this long to, for uh, for it to really start coming out. You know, it's taking lockdown. Oh, that could just be a coincidence. I don't know, but mm. it, it's just a shame. And I, I I hate the whole, you know, male um, being a dominant sex, if you will, and you know, just people just thinking they're better than each other. And it's just it's just disgusting. You know, people find this wrestling as an excuse to think they can do it. Obviously, think there's somebody. He's like, oh, well, you want to go on a show? Well, you know, I, yeah, I absolutely it's hate it. Uh, you know, and it's <laughs> there's so many people who I hoped would come forward and, and come on my show and talk about it. Um, and out of all the old school guys, only Chick Cullum, he was the only guy that stood up and, and said anything about it <coughs> because Chick's a straight up guy. And he was one of the only ones who came out and said anything because all the others were too afraid. Why? You, you tell me. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, speak volumes like this. Mm. So let's move on. You know, we, we've had to say about that. You know, thank you for being so open. You know, I, I respect you know what you've done as well. You know, because you have been somebody who spoke about it a lot, as long as you know, as, as um, as well as other pe other you know people in wrestling as well. So you know, much respect to all of them as well. You know, they've all done all yeah, the, yeah, of fantastic job in uh, trying to help out. You know, it's been brilliant to see. You know, it's nice that. You know, come together and just as a wrestling community, if you will, and try to help people who are in need. I think there's more, we, I, it needs saying, um, because I don't want people thinking this is just a negative thing, but yeah, yeah. We, must re we must remember that the good does outweigh the bad yeah. when it comes down to British wrestling. I don't want people to get the wrong idea, and for, or if you've got plans to be part of it, think, fuck, I don't want to do that anymore. Don't, yeah. don't, don't, please don't think that the good does outweigh the bad by some distance. But I will say it's, yeah, it's really important. It's really important for, I mean, we, we have a full safety policy, a safeguarding policy in place at EWW. We've got it online on our website, EWWIFRESTING.com, if you want to have a look at it. And it's very important for trainers uh, to, to discuss these safeguarding policies, not just ours, but all of them with, with their students and online etiquette. Because that's we must remember that's where these guys pray and hunt, um, and so before you're teaching bumps, before you're teaching wrist locks, talk about online etiquette because I tell you that is the that is the future right there, and that's how we're yeah. going to stamp on this. Yeah, definitely, no, I couldn't agree more. So you be to a podcast, and now we're going to speak about your brand new book, Simply mm. the Beast. What made you one day think I'm going to write a book about my wrestling career? I I uh, used to be a freelance journalist years ago when when I left when I left uh, school uh, I was a freelance journalist and it was a real backbiting cutthroat business far worse than wrestling and it was really difficult. <laughs> wow, that's I, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was a real bitchy industry, and so um, uh, an old friend of mine, Neil Cameron, who uh, he organises the uh, big Elvis conventions at the O2. Um, he's, he's a super guy and uh, I've got a lot of time for Neil. He messaged me one day. He's the guy who did uh, um, Roy, Roy Bevis's book. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, um, for, was it Wrestling With My Mind? 
Yeah, um, I think yeah. it was called. And Jeannie Clark, Stone Cold's ex, um, she did Behind the Broken Glass. So he did both of those. Um, he sort of ca- helped co-write them or ghostwrite them. And he contacted me and said, look, I've cleaned out my loft. I found a load of old uh, WOW magazines that you're in. Um, would you ever fancy writing a book? And I was like, <coughs> I'd love to, but I'll be honest, I'm never going to get around to it because I can't remember shit. I was either drunk, I, I was either drunk or high for most of my fucking career. I can't remember a lot of it. And I thought, I'd, I'd love to, but I, it's never going to happen now. But And then lockdown happened. And I was in a position where I was lucky enough to be, because uh, I'm an undertaker by trade. Okay. Um, um, I, so I work in the funeral industry. And because I've got diabetes, they wanted to keep me away from the body. So they sent me over to this office where I was, I was working. Um, I, I, was, I was office bound for the first time in my life with just a computer. And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to have a go at this. So with the aid of a lot of people's memories, a lot of the wrestlers who used to wrestle for us, um, I started just, I, t- I was typing and typing furiously for about three months. Didn't stop. And I was just typing and typing. And it was, it was, it was amazing. It was like a, a visceration of memories and stories. And it was, I cannot tell you how, how cathartic it was. It was a real, it was emotional. It sounds fucking ridiculous. But I'll tell you what it really was. And, it, and I just wrote that book as honestly and as openly as I could. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of it. That's the main thing, you know. Uh, as long as you're proud of it, that's the main thing. And uh, you have had people actually buy it from Amazon and had it. Well, I've, 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 I've made. Uh, well, let's, let's put it this way. Financially, it's got me in the world through three lockdowns. So it's been, uh, it's been, it's been, very, it's been very good. I'm very, I'm like I said, I'm very proud of it. There's been some beautiful reviews written by fans and other wrestlers alike who've read it online, and I do appreciate that very much. Um, it's been very well received. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to bits with it. It runs from uh, my childhood right up till 2014. I'm currently in the process of writing the follow-up at the moment, um, which will take me through, take us through um, uh, right up to the end of my career. And uh, yeah, I can't tell you how how, uh, how rewarding the whole thing's been. I was well, well done, and good luck with your next book. I mean, Thank you, man. So, what is next for Dominator? And so this lockdown is lifted. What is next for him? What is next for the beast? Well, I, like I said, I want to get into... I've, I've uh, come together with um, um, my, my tag partner, John Cosell, who's um, done a lot of big movies. He's, he's, done, uh, he's done some of the fight scenes in the Bourne movies and, uh, and Thor, and, and, and uh, he made a film, uh, a Scottish gangster movie called The Wee Man. And uh, he was he was in that as well. And we've been putting our, our heads together about some about some scripts for movies we're, we're thinking of doing. Um, but that'll be some way down the line. Yeah, I've got my book. Obviously, that's that is a, a labour of love. Um, but at the moment, the main thing is to uh, get our school up and running again. We've got another. I think we've got another four or five weeks until we're legally allowed to open Extreme Academy. And um, we've got a gorgeous new facility called the Raw Performance Facility in Hastings. It's absolutely stunning. Um, it's been totally refurbed. There's been about 40 grand spent on it. Um, we've got... Not much of no, it looks the, it look, does look the business. Um, it's, it's, and we welcome everybody. It's not just, uh, it's not just our local students. We have students coming across from, from Gosport, from, from, from Eastbourne, from Brighton, from all over the place. So if you want to come down, we, we, uh, we're there um, at uh, Raw Performance on Castle and Industrial Estate in Hastings. And that's every Tuesday night from 8 p.m., every Sunday um, from 2 p.m. And, uh, yeah, it's, I'm really proud of it. It looks fantastic. Thanks. Awesome. So, so, so let's, let's do, like, a little scenario, OK? So this is why I'd like to ask trainers. You know, I, I recently had Dean Ormark on my podcast, and I said he asked the exact same question to him. So I'm new to the business, brand new, been watching wrestling all my life. I'm like, I really want to give this a go. I rock up to your uh, academy. So what is the first thing you would do or say to me or how would you introduce yourself? What would you put me through on the first session? Well, I'd ask you who your favourite wrestler is. My favourite wrestler is The Undertaker. Why? Because I think he's an iconic wrestler. I think I I respect his loyalty for the the business. 
God, when you put on a spot, I'm not quite sure. But all around, I just the Undertaker. I think he is everything that a wrestler should be. You know, it's like like worth ethic and yeah. How, uh, you know, have you had any fighting experience? Have you had any previous, have you done judo? Have you done martial arts? Uh, no, I've done, may, might have done a bit of backyard wrestling, you know, but I'm, but I'm here to learn. I'm, here, I'm keen to learn. So, yeah. That would be how I'd start. From there, we let, we, it's bumps, it's bump drills. It's boring. It's really fucking boring. But with Adrian, I learned on a bit of carpet <laughs> in a shed. Um, and, and bear in mind, we're in Florida, so we're in 95 degrees. Yeah. There was no air. You were literally sucking out of your bum hole like that. It was there. Uh, you were sucking air big time. It was it was it was awful. You you know, you'd be outside being sick. It was unbelievable. So and he would drill the same thing day after day after day after day until you were doing it in your sleep. And I'd do the same thing. Luckily, now, as I've got older, I'm 46 this year. I've got four trainers who uh, who I've taught myself personally, who are, they're all my head trainers. Um, my wife, Dean Jackson, Dave Hobbs, and uh, and Lenny Lawless. And all of them are uh, very competent and have wrestled for loads of different promotions. And they are my main main trainers. But they all, they all have my same ethos, which is bump drills, bump drills, bump drills. You're not allowed in the ring until I say you're ready to, because that's, that, that is our, that's our church. Yeah. That is our place that we, you know, that, that is a place that is, you, you're, you're not allowed in there until you're ready, basically. I'm not going to wax too lyrical about it. It's obvious to anyone listening to this, what the, the wrestling ring should be sacred. And you don't just get it. I get people messaging me saying, oh, well, I know what I'm doing. I've seen it on TV. You know, okay, just come along. Just come along. And we've had people come and stay for years and who've, who've lived their dream and wrestled in front of over a thousand people. And it's been fantastic. But I always try and keep their, their feet on the ground and say, not all shows in the country are as good as this. Yeah. You know, I've done shows in, you know, you remember the Phoenix Nights? You remember yeah, Phoenix yeah. Nights? I've done, I've done shows in places like that, you know, where there's a little, there's a haze of cigarette smoke hanging yeah. in the air. You yeah. know, we, we've all done them. But my students come along and they, they, they work on their bump drills. They, they, they work on the psychology. They work on their footwork. My, my wife's a personal trainer. They have to, they, they do 45 minutes of cardio before they even get into a lockup. Nice. We, we make sure that they're, they're, they're trained hard. Yeah. And, you know, we do train them hard and we teach them to respect the ring, to respect each other, to respect, more importantly, the business. And I also give them homework because, <laughs> because when, now, thanks to YouTube, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say what the name of which of my students is because he will probably be watching this. And it'll be very embarrassing for him. I said to him, right, well, so we're going to watch some, some from World of Sport. And he said, oh, what channel's that? I said, pardon me? He said, what channel's World of Sport? He'd never fucking heard of World of Sport. So, and, and I've had I've had the likes of Doug Williams, Danny Boy Collins, Tolly Plested from the UFC. I've had them all come into to my school. And, you know, I have guest spots. So I, I get them taught. They get taught the, 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 from, by the, from the very, very best. Yeah. Um, whether it's in the world of MMA or pro wrestling, because I want them to be able to look after themselves. And when they're ready, um, then they get moved out and they get to work for some for some camps like Slam Wrestling in Birmingham. They've been yeah. up to they've been up to Norwich. They've been up to uh, Fight Factory. They've been over to um, LDN. And I, and I and I farm them out just to give them an experience and to realise that not not all show. And this isn't a, this isn't to say. Yeah, those shows aren't, you know, aren't up to standard. But it's to say, not all, not all places are the same as EWW. Yeah. At EWW, your family and your friends are there. You're going to get heat. You go to these places, no one's going to know who the fuck you are. So you're going to have to really work hard. And some of them at first are like, whoa, walking out there to, to no response. Now you see. Now you see. And it's only then, all of a sudden, their, their world all of a sudden goes from that to that. Oh, sure. <laughs> Do you, do you know? And, yeah. and I, I was never, I was never taught any of that. I yeah. was never, I was never told any of that when I was at wrestling school. I never had. Uh, Adrian never told me. You know, sometimes you walk out to the sound of your own footsteps. What do you do then? Yeah. But, <clears throat> no, it never happened. Um, but so, all of those things that I missed, I try and put on. 
our kids because I think that's the way to go. Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, they need to have the experience. They need to understand how it can be. It's not, like you said, it's not all a thousand crowd members. You know, it can oh, be yeah. like two. You know, the, the least I've yeah. worked in front of is eight, I believe. And, you know, it's not all about how big the crowd is, you know. No. It, it's always just... It's hey, a- listen, as long as you're... Uh, yeah, as long as you're getting paid, and, and, and you need to remember, so you, if you're getting paid, and it doesn't matter how many people are out there, if they've paid to get in there, you fucking entertain them. Yeah. Definitely. And it doesn't matter. And I, and I, I, I'll be honest. I would rather work. I'd rather work in a small venue that's full than a big venue that's half full. Always, I'd always, I, I've always preferred intimate, intimate yeah. little shows like that. I've always found them to be very, uh, you know, very electric. Yeah, definitely. And there's always the, uh, the different crowds as well, because you get some crowds that are really easy to work, and then you get the other crowds which are like, hmm, I don't know, I'm not sure, but you've really got to like try and work with them people who are just not into it. And uh, it's all about oh, the- I, 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 Again, I, I, I talk all about that. You know, I, I was part of the FWA. It was, it was very difficult because they were so-called wrestling purists. And mm-hmm. there was me in my spiked shoulder pads and my face paint, yeah. and all, all very generic, I suppose. And of course, they were like, you know, they took against me straight away. So I had to up the level somewhat and uh, be as stiff as possible just to get their fucking attention. Um, but of course, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, you yeah, can. You're lucky if you can type on your laptop nowadays on Facebook. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I got one last question for you. So, obviously, mm. like I said about your glorious beard, because I'm in love with it, I have beard envy. Um, I've noticed lately on your Facebook you have been promoting for a company called Beard Coaching, I want to say. That's right. So is that a sponsor, ambassador, or is that just a case you're just feeling generous and you're just like, wait, look at this? Yeah, exactly. No, she, uh, she came to me and said, uh, what do you think of this product? I said, give it a try. It's awesome. Um, it's fantastic. It's uh, I would recommend it to, to anyone like yourself. Um, get on it on Instagram. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it is it is what it is. Um, it's uh, and and, and I've, I've this only I, I shaved this almost off entirely almost a year ago. It was really short, and it's yeah. just grown back again, lovely. But it's gone so grey now. Um, It'd be and, after uh, Christmas. Yeah, well, well, exactly. I was trying to grow my hair too. You know, I thought I can get a nice nice little sideline there, can't I? Me you cheeky nice. bastard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> So that's my questions out of the way. Um, like I said to you before, I have fan questions. You know, I, um, I this might my, it's my way of interacting with the fans who yeah. to interact with the uh, guests. Uh, I just feel it's important, you know. But um, unfortunately, I only have one question. Mm. I'm a bit disappointed in that because I do like it when people do sort of bombard questions. Yeah. Um, uh, with the questions from Tristan Hayes. Uh, memories of setting up CCW and dishing out contracts above oh. Adrian Trowbridge. Bloody hell. Uh, <laughs> God, that's, a, that's uh, that was just something else. I, I, I quit after my t- initial time with uh, All Star um, and Ring Wrestling Stars. I, I, I thought, do you know what? This isn't for me. Fuck it. I, I got so, I, I got so, I was so disinterested in wrestling after being traveling all around the country for these guys and just getting told, oh, you're, you're shit, you know, you're no good, you know, and just getting generally beaten up by the old school at the time. I thought, do you know what? I don't know if I'm going to be bothered with this, so I'm going to go and get a desk job. And then I was contacted out of the blue by these, by these two brothers who were from Kidderminster, called right. the Webb Brothers. Right. Something else that was. I mean, they, they were, I, I suppose in a lot of ways, they were ahead of their time. Uh, but what one of them was agoraphobic and he was the talker on the phone. He was the guy with all the, could dare I say, charisma. And he looked just like uh, that dude from the darkness, Justin, what's his name? Justin Hawkins. Is That's it. it. Yeah. He, he looked just like him, but he was agoraphobic. He would not leave the house. He literally would not leave the house. And his brother, Chris, was the guy who was the internet geek because the internet, this was 97. So this was on the internet. Um, and uh, the wrestling uh, newsletters were starting to go online yeah. more. So he, he was really big on that, and he wanted to get a crew together of all the top wrestlers in the UK and put on a show. So, of course, there was, there was, there was me, there was 
uh, Alex Shane, there was Doug Williams, there was Jody, there was Johnny Storr. I don't know. No, I wasn't. I don't think Johnny was a part of it, but Jody certainly was. And uh, I had my debut with for CCW with Jody. But what a fucking disappointment of a. a they, they, they'd book all these halls with Mad Eli. Yeah. Of all people. And what needs to rip you off? Well, well, he, he never, he never ripped me off. But he, Bath, Bath Pavilions, this was. Yeah. So a, a legendary wrestling venue. And the first show, they did well. They drew about four hundred, and it was good. And I went on with Jody, and we had a, we had a cracker. And uh, there was a guy there called, uh, oh Jesus, the gangster. Oh yes, I know him. I know him. Gareth, oh. Hum- Gareth Humphreys. Oh yeah, yeah. With a lady Sue. Yeah. <laughs> And they, they they had this travelling band of uh, of like hillbilly fuckwits with them, and uh, who all sort of came along with them. And these guys that hadn't seen a, hadn't seen a shower in like months. No, and I was not. like, I, I, I was like turned up there with my entourage. I was like, what the fuck is this? And uh, they had all these big ideas, and I think they fizzled out after about four four shows. But from that, um, that uh, from that came EWW we basically uh got all the guys because yeah they were they were trying to tie people down to contracts and these contracts I think I still got I I, ke- I keep almost everything I, I've I've got a huge collection of wrestling memorabilia the stuff that I've been on and they, they drew up these contracts that were just astounding looking back on it promising I think they were promising this about a 15 and a half grand a year oh, and, wow. and wow. but, but <laughs> <laughs> and people were falling for it and signing their lives away. And they were saying, well, you can't wrestle for anyone else. And, and of course, people like Jody and that were wrestling at the time for Hammerlock. Mm. And uh, in the end, I ended up, uh, I ended up saying, do you know, fuck this. Um, we, 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 got, we, did, we put on a show at Cheltenham Town Hall, huge venue. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and basically, we ended up um, taking the show over, me and J- Jamie Chipperfield from the, the Chipperfield Circus family. And uh, we, we ended up fucking those brothers off, and uh, that EWW was born from that. But whoever asked that question obviously knows know, knows quite a lot about my my past because that that is uh, that's a part of my history that I don't talk about very often because it was it was oh god it was awful. Yeah, well, um, that that Tristan. Yeah, but I, I'll speak to you more about it after. I'll, I'll explain why he knows you. But yeah, so that's the fan questions done. Um, great story. I love that. <laughs> um, so is there anything else you would like to plug before we go? No, nah, man, just my book, simplythebeast.com. Um, check it out. Uh, like I said, it's available on Amazon. It's available on Kindle. Um, and um, I, I, I'm also selling some copies, which I've, we've sold out of at the moment, but I will have them back in stock in the next couple of weeks from my website, www-wrestling.com, where you can also find our on-demand service, which has got 20 years of EWW on, um, from the people that brought you Babe Station. Um, it's, that's a, it's, a, it's a very, it's a beautiful looking site, very proud of it. And obviously our podcast, uh, stiffrighthand.com, uh, and also my wife's uh, fitness page, Code Red Fitness. If any of you guys uh, locally or not locally, want to get in touch with her she's um also doing online classes so uh if you want to go down that route then by all means hit us up nice well there we go so this has been my guest the british beast the bearded behemoth <laughs> dominator i oh, know i'm upset sorry and i have been the uh, beer drinking heavy metal listening bald-headed broader keyboard Thank you all for watching. Thanks for all the subs and the likes and the comments and all that. My next episode will be my last episode of the season, and that is with none other than British wrestling legend Scrubber Daily. Well, that's going to be exciting. And uh, yeah, stay safe, stay positive. Hashtag, yeah. The star that-